You're watching Bread and Roses, a weekly political social magazine that's broadcast in English and Persian via New Channel TV. Hello everyone, I hope you're well. I'm Mariam Namazi. In this week's program, I've got a fantastic interview with Sarah Haydar of Ex-Muslims of North America on the ridiculous safe space policies at many universities. I'll also be speaking to you about Muharram and Ashura, uh, self-flagellations and uh, Hossein parties in Iran. Uh, the fact that some students have been flogged because their parents weren't able to pay school entry fees and the impending execution of Zainab Lokran, a juvenile offender. I'll also be talking to you about the insane fatwa of the week which will be about mourning at an Iranian football match and the slice of life is going to be on Dia Khan's Islam's non-believers. You don't want to miss this program, stay with us. As you know, this week and this month is Muharram, it's Ashura, it is a period of mourning when Hossein, one of the Imams, was killed on the battlefield of Karbala. And there's a lot of flagellation going on, self-flagellation, Hossein, 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 Hossein. And uh, there's lots of bloodletting, blood galore. I mean, the more blood there is, the happier they are, the more they like it. And of course, there's some religious leaders who've said that, you know, all this bloodletting is uh, giving um, uh, the religion a bad name. It's showing it to be backward, uh, you know, it's just giving it such a negative image. And uh, I suppose the first question that pops into my mind is, you think? to say the least you know and of course uh, if you look at these um, uh, you know the squares filled with blood uh, of course uh, you know there's lots of people that don't take part in these ceremonies in fact in Iran it's called Hossein party because it gives a chance for young people to come out meet each other mingle and uh, uh, enjoy a sort of public carnival atmosphere uh, aside from all the bloodletting where they can get to meet each other and, and uh, have a good time and it's sanctioned, it's allowed by the state basically. Um, and of course if you've seen some of these photos and video footage there's children involved in these ceremonies as well where if they're babies too you've got their parents helping with um, uh, the, the sort of flagellation and again this is clearly nothing but child abuse it's violence against children in the name of religion it's it's outrageous now following on that there's a case of a child a juvenile offender that I'd like to talk to you about her name is Zainab Lokran she was arrested and put on death row at the age of 17 for killing her husband. Now, she had a child marriage, she uh, was abused by her husband, and um, she confessed to killing him under serious torture. She went to trial, had no lawyer during her trial, and she was sentenced in an unfair trial to execution. Now, she was pregnant, so her execution was delayed. Unfortunately, her child was born recently, stillborn, after, two days after she heard of the execution of one of her cellmates uh, in Iran. And um, now her execution is imminent. She's come out and said that it was a, her brother-in-law who had actually raped her on a, a number of occasions, who had killed her husband and who had told her that he would uh, pardon her under the blood money rules in Iran. And, and now she's facing execution. The execution is going ahead nonetheless. And so one of the things we're asking people to do is to put pressure to make sure that she's not executed. She's innocent. Uh, non she's innocent she's clearly stated that she she's innocent she hasn't even had a fair trial even so the death penalty in all instances is inhuman it shouldn't be tolerated under any circumstances uh, but more importantly when you're looking at the question of juvenile offenders in particular it is such a violation of children's rights and Iran is full of it's the land of violations of children's rights I don't know if you heard reports recently of some children who had been flogged in a village called Mukhtarabad in Kerman because their parents were unable to afford the school fees they were flogged and then expelled I mean on 
believable. You cannot make these things up. This is a land, a country where child abuse is part of the system, it's part of the law, and it is, uh, you know, uh, something that is so prevalent. Uh, it's really, really so tragic for so many children who are faced with these sorts of rules, whether it's uh, execution, whether it's forced marriage, child, so-called child marriages, and whether it is um, being flogged because your parents cannot afford school fees because they're too poor. Unbelievable. A few weeks ago when I was speaking at the Women in Secularism conference in Washington DC, I met with Sarah Haydar from Ex-Muslims of North America and interviewed her about a panel discussion we had had earlier on the ridiculous concept of safe spaces at universities. I hope you enjoy this interview because I think Sarah raises some really important points. Stay with us, don't miss her interview. Sarah Haydar, lovely to have you on the program. I wanted to speak to you about uh, the conference that just passed, Women in Secularism, mm. and the discussion around safe spaces. From your perspective, what's the problem with safe spaces at universities in particular? Well, I think um, where the idea begins, which is to say that you know some students, when they're uh, having experienced trauma or significant setbacks or oppression, um, they want a space on their own where they can feel relaxed and they don't have to feel um, embattled by you know various people. I think that from uh, on on that just uh, basic perspective, it seems acceptable, and I think a, uh, people have a hard time saying no to such a thing. It seems kind of ridiculous, except in practice, it is one of those things that leaks into campus life in general when students come to expect that there are times and especially uh, within classrooms where they can feel that they must be protected from certain ideas and especially that they must must be protected from ideas that are uh, troubling to their identities and unfortunately too many students think that uh, their politics are part of their identity and this makes it very difficult to talk about politics in general to talk about social issues that are so important um, in in our discourse and that it makes things uh, very difficult in college campuses and I know that there are people who you know the dissent from uh, the I guess the norm thinking in in college campuses and they have a hard time speaking up they have a hard time uh, saying their piece and just expressing intellectual disagreement because they might be hurting someone's feelings or identities and they, they don't want to be called a bigot, they don't want to be called hateful, so they are silenced. And this is a very unfortunate state of affairs. I don't think anybody thought that it would end up this way, that this is where we would be, but this is where we are. And we have to look back and see where, where did we go wrong and what can we do to change it. Well, isn't it nice not to hurt people's feelings what's the problem with that why, why not do that well it's absolutely it's it's what is nice is not the same thing as what is good and I think that sometimes uh, people on the left and liberals in general confuse those terms. You know, they think that what is nice and what is going to uh, make people happy is the same thing as doing uh, the right thing in any circumstance and doing a good thing. So when it comes to specifically people who are under, you know, religious delusions, people who feel that women are just, you know, uh, secondary citizens um, in terms of, you know, the law on earth because that is what their religion says, I mean, they, that that is what they feel and if you were to say that no men and women deserve equality under the law here on earth today you would be hurting their feelings and uh, there are cases where we have to say that it's okay to do that it's okay to not be nice to people who are not doing uh, things that are good for our society that are going to be healthy for our society that are going to promote the kind of ideals that we want to see in the world what do you think of this idea where um, with the you know safe spaces they say are meant to defend minority rights. So what happens to minorities within minorities? Well, that's, I, I think that's a very interesting question, and that's the, the main problem with this, with this dialogue and with this discussion is because it looks at minorities as just a group of people who all agree on, on everything, and that there is um, some sort of uh, 
uh, you know, single, singular um, idea that they can all agree on and a policy that they can all agree on. And that's very dangerous for people, people like us, people who are ex-Muslims, who are minorities within minorities. It makes it very hard for us to speak out uh, because uh, we feel that, okay, when you are... Um, somehow betraying your race you're betraying your people and it can become a very toxic thing and it's it is one of those things that seems like it's helping minorities and it's helping race relations but i really think it's one of those things that is racist at its core and it's making race relations worse you mentioned on the panel uh, an example of a rape law and how that's not being discussed in law classes because of these sort of safe, safe space policies. Tell us about that. Well, that was um, when I was researching for the panel in general, just to just to see about the impact of um, you know the discussions like safe space and microaggressions, what they've the, the impact they've had on student life and on discussion in general. It was probably the saddest thing that that I saw because it was something where you can directly see how harmful this would be for women's rights where uh, some students are so sensitized to discussions of uh, of rape um, or of uh, violent assaults um, um, to towards women that uh, they can't even discuss it they can't even talk about it and especially when it comes to when it comes to rape law when uh, professors such as that the Harvard professor that I mentioned um, in the panel I think her name is Jeannie Sook she talked about how she specifically chose cases that were difficult uh, they were there were cases where it wasn't clear if the aggressor deserved punishment if he, if if the aggressor really was an aggressor if this really was rape and and students have to pick a side and think about it and discuss the issues um, in you know in a nuanced way and some students found this very difficult to do and uh, some professors uh, she she said in her article have have felt that they can no longer discuss rape law in class. It's just too sensitive a topic. Students are um, too easily, uh, too, too, they too easily feel that they are being, you know, uh, attacked in some way uh, or uncomfortable enough, un uncomfortable enough that they complain um, to, to the, you know, the various administrators in the universities. And so professors think, well, is it even worth discussing? And this is a such a clear way where we can see how this is harmful towards women. We need to study rape law. We need to talk about the complexities about rape law and what it, what rape is, what an aggressor is, um, what consent is, and just the various the, the the gray line that that is some sometimes difficult to talk about. But we need to talk about this. Um, and this is, I think, such a clear way to see how um, these. Uh, discussions where people people say that I'm it's too sensitive to talk about I can't talk about this um, I'm, this is hurting me too much how this clouds our judgment it clouds our thinking and it disrupts learning on campus and it could be that practically everything upsets someone and it will end up not being able to talk about anything basically absolutely and, and uh, who will that hurt I think in the end um, if, if we look about if, if, if we look at our society um, as a place where, you know, how they say, white males have, have a lot of power. Well, um, if that's the case, then they're not going to be the ones who are significantly hurt by discourses like this. It's going to be uh, women and minorities who bear the brunt of it, and especially minorities within minorities who really can't talk about their issues at all, who are truly silenced and have no institutional power to be able to talk about their experiences. And that's what's most devastating. And I think when we when we look at it as these safe spaces, these microaggressions are a way to protect minorities, I don't think they are. I think some minorities, and I say some because I know many who are not, some minorities may feel safer, but I don't think they are safer. And I think they're creating an atmosphere where we're, they are significantly more in danger because we do not have the intellectual structure to support the kinds of policies that we care about that will protect minorities, that will protect women, that will protect you know sexual minorities, religious minorities. You were saying that we need to go back and find another way. What do you think those are? Well, I think uh, what's what's definitely clear is that these patronizing sort of rules on campus we know that they don't help 
we know that sometimes they make things worse and they create an atmosphere on campus where people feel like they can't talk about the issues that we really need to talk about, the issues that are very politicized, the issues where emotions really get in the way. Those are the issues that we really need to hash out. We know that this isn't helping. Um, and I can't say for sure that I have a solution, although my feeling is, is that speech helps and empowering people and to make them especially minorities and women to make them feel like hey you can speak and if you are persuasive if you have facts you might not get through to somebody the first time but you'll do it again and again and again and it'll work and we know that it has worked because we've seen how much our society has progressed we've seen how much in in this this liberal assist intellectual system where we use words we use arguments uh, to fight to, to get our way we found that women's rights have gotten better women have a have it better in in America, in the UK, in the Western world in general, than to do in in uh, the parts of the world where we can't speak at all. So we know how useful it has been in the past, and I'm worried that we're we're giving it up. We're thinking that oh well, uh, we're we're not looking at the gains that we have made throughout the decades and and centuries even by using this very important tool because we become impatient maybe with the progress, and um, so I think. Let's look back to see what's worked and respect what's worked and not be so quick to denounce it and not be so quick to throw it away because it, freedom of speech really has been what we can count on, uh, what we can count on to be there for us, those that, that don't have institutional power, those that don't have uh, financial power, we don't have any real power, but we do have this. We can convince people with our ideas. A final question. You mentioned how dangerous it is for us offensive speech to be equated with violence. Can you talk about that? I think that's um, something that's very uh, clearly related in my mind with uh, the idea of blasphemy, where there is such a sin, where there is such a speech that is so harmful, it is so uh, hurtful either to a god or maybe to uh, certain people, that it it is in itself a form of violence. And when it is a form of violence, uh, I think you just inevitably justify the belief that some speech can be answered by physical violence because it is violence in itself that legi that it, that it is a legitimate response to uh, to answer offensive words to offensive verbal violence with physical violence and that's where we get to justifications like charlie hebdo unfortunately where people thought that there was something some things that they said that were so hurtful that were so out of bounds they were a sort of violence onto those people they didn't make that distinction between speech acts and physical acts they blurred that line and because they blurred that line we saw a lot of people that lost their lives and i think that this is something that we have to be very careful about when we when we talk about speech acts and physical acts. We have to be very careful about these lines and make sure that the distinction is clear because our society depends on our ability to make those distinctions and be very clear about them. That's how our progress has happened. That minorities who were once very offensive to those in power, you know, people like you know, gays, um, uh, LGBT in general, but various minorities whose uh, appeals were offensive to those in power, but they were allowed to speak but they were allowed to make their case. And in the end, we have a better society. So let's, um, I think we should be very clear about those distinctions and liberals especially should make them. Thank you so much, Sarah. Thank you for having me. I hope you enjoyed the interview with Sarah Haydar. I think she raises so many brilliant points in such an articulate way. I mean, you know, the, the, the idea behind safe spaces, again, is one of those things like Islamophobia, which are used in order to feign a defense of minority communities and those who have faced discrimination, but actually it's a sinister way of trying to silence and censor much needed discussion and debate. And I think uh, as someone who's been at the receiving end of safe spaces, you know, where I've been told that my talks need to be barred or they need to be cancelled because the poor little Islamist on the university campus that wants me dead 
will be hurt, his feelings will be hurt if he has to hear any form of criticism of Islam or his political movement, the Islamist movement. What's clear though, of course, is these are ploys to censor and silence much needed debate and discussion, particularly when it comes around Islam and Islamism. I think there's a huge difference between speech and violence and harm. And I think the fact that these are being blurred, as Sarah Haydar says, is so dangerous and most dangerous for minorities within minorities, dissenters uh, and people who aren't going along with the status quo. Uh, in a sense, freedom of expression is the freedom for dissenters to say things that are different, to say things um, that are not part of of mainstream and status quo and that's why it's so important not to allow safe space concepts to restrict free speech. Free speech is really one of the only things that those under attack have in order to defend themselves so uh, censorship is not the way to, to, to protect people who've been discriminated against. In fact, free speech is the best protection against discrimination and abuse because it gives people the right to fight back, the possibility to fight back. باید فضای مسابقه صد در صد آشورایی و کربلایی باشه باید در و دیوار اونجا سیاه پوش بشه تمام فضا سیاه پوش بشه the insane fatwa of the week is, of course, from Tehran again. It is from the Tehran Friday prayers leader who was very concerned that the Iran-South uh, Korea World Cup qualifying match was to take place during the holy month of Ashura and Hussein, 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 Hussein. And therefore, he had said that if the match is going to go ahead, because they tried to cancel it, but you're, you're not going to cancel a football match in Iran, that's for sure. Uh, if they're going to have it, the walls have to be covered in black and that instead of clapping, all the uh, audience have to, uh, football fans have to shout Ya Hussein and they all have to wear black and black armbands and there would be like morning ceremonies during uh, halftime break and stuff like that. So obviously a uh, big, big joke because the fans cheered and they cheered like crazy when Iran won the match. and. Uh, Again, it just shows how insane, insane, insane these fatwas are and how no one really listens to them. I mean, if people wore black, they had to because they had to get into the football stadium. But they went not because they wanted to do Hussein, 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 but because they wanted to cheer on their football team. Slice of Life this week is uh, from uh, Dia Khan and it is her new film on Islam's non-believers. It was broadcast last week and there's a lot of hullabaloo around her film, uh, many, many messages of support and the usual messages of hate. However, I think it's an important film and, and a film that for the first time ever really uh, looks at the issue of Islam's non-believers, of ex-Muslims, from a very human perspective. The difficulties uh, that are faced, the challenges that are faced, the hate and violence that are faced by ex-Muslims, but most importantly, and why it's included in the slice of life, is the resistance. The fact that it inspires, it brings hope, and it challenges uh, a movement that is so violent not with violence, but with non-violence, with love, with rights and human beings at its core and center. So it's a brilliant film. Well done to the wonderful Dia Khan. And we look forward to you looking at it. Please look at it. Try and find it. Look at it. It's on ITV's website. It'll also be available on YouTube hopefully soon if you live outside of Britain. Watch it, watch it, watch it. 
it's a not to be missed film anyway we've reached the end of our program i hope you've enjoyed this week's program and i look forward to seeing you again at the same time same place next week until then goodbye Hi, I'm Mariam Namazi. And I'm Fadi Bospuya. We're hosting a program called Bread and Roses. It's a weekly program that's broadcast in Persian and English in the Middle East and North Africa, primarily Iran as well. And it's also shown on YouTube internationally. And we've been doing this since last May. We're coming up to our year's anniversary. And yeah. we, we've had quite a lot of fun making these videos. We discuss taboo breaking, free thinking ideas. The Islamic regime of Iran has called us immoral and corrupt and that's why the, you need to support us we are and the alternative voice in Middle East and North Africa of corruption and immorality so do support us here's a short video from patreon that explains how you can help us with even just one dollar a week that's nothing support us patreon lets fans become patrons of their favorite artists and content creators it's different than Kickstarter because it's not about one big project that requires lots of funding. It's more for bloggers or YouTubers or web comics, anyone who creates on a regular basis. Here's how it works. When you become a patron, you're agreeing to give an artist a tip of an amount you set every time they release a piece of content, whether it's a new song, a video, or a recipe. You can set a monthly maximum to make sure that you're always within your budget. Choose an amount, enter your payment information, and you're done. Becoming a patron allows you to view and post in the artist's stream, and in exchange for your support, artists offer additional patron packages, which might include monthly Google Hangouts, music production tutorials, pre-sale concert tickets, or anything they can offer as a way to say thanks. Patreon, empowering a new generation of content creators.